happened today in the Houston court? Um, so today we um, had our next pretrial hearing and the prosecution did bring what the judge was requesting. Specifically that is uh, emails that Dowell had relating to Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Austin, and court action. Uh, additionally, uh, the names of the two other undercovers. But all of this information was given to the judge in a private, uh, confidential way. It's called in camera. That's the term that they refer to it. So she is then going to review that those documents um, and then give to the defense what she believes is relevant to the case if there is in fact enough um, information in the documents that she was given. She was also given um, emails from Houston uh, from a um, I, I don't know if he's a detective or a sergeant or a lieutenant exactly, but he is the point person between the district attorney's office and the task force that was uh, involved with the arrests. And his name is Baldassano. Um, so Baldassano turned over all of his emails today as well. Um, there has been a lot of uh, speculation in the past about a provocateur um, or somebody uh, within uh, the government uh, influencing what happened or, or these arrests. So we had requested information regarding anything like that from Baltasano months ago. And he said he had no no uh, no idea or no information uh, of any you know agents being involved uh, in, in the actual arrests. Um, so he didn't turn over any information. But now he's turned over all of the emails that he, that he might have. The other thing that's kind of interesting is, related to that, there's been um, a lot of verbal gymnastics happening uh, to s stick to the story that HPD and APD did not coordinate in any way um, regarding this arrest. That, that uh, police officers in Austin were not talking to police officers in Houston as far as, as, far as Dow's uh, statements go. Um, but what was revealed is that in the emails that the prosecution had over that come from APD and Dow. Um, there is communication between Houston and Austin. It's not, and they're not being specific as to who is making the communications, but they are saying that there was a, an intelligence agency involved, and specifically the Fusion Center was named by the attorney representing the, um, the detectives there in, in court. So specifically, what, can, you, can you give me more details what they said about the Fusion Center? Not much. They just said that there was an, uh, a, an intelligence agency uh, involved so, so, so the way the way it came out is that um, they, the this intelligence agency is mentioned in the emails that was handed over by prosecution from APD. Um, so we know that there is a third uh, element uh, involved, and that would be the fusion center or this intelligence agency, which is the regional intelligence agency. All right. So did uh, did Dow actually testify again this time? Or? Dow did not show his face in court. They kept him in a room in the back, and uh, John got a picture of the back of his head as they uh, quickly escorted him out the back way uh, but he did not have to uh, come into court and make any testimony. What about what about the lieutenants that were subpoenaed last time? Well, Spangler did show up. Spangler was there but he did not say anything. Um, the judge seemed to have gotten to a point in the process where she didn't needed to review so I wasn't asking any additional questions. But those subpoenas will uh, will continue to the next pretrial hearing as long as the motion to quash is not, um, is not uh, I guess, uh, given or acknowledged. I don't know what the terminology would be. But the, um, the, the attorney for the detectives brought a motion to quash the subpoenas today. And he he uh, submitted that this morning, so the judge could not uh, rule one way or the other. She has to read that. She's got to review that. So that will be, um, again, in three weeks. So, so tell me everything that will be decided in three weeks again. Um, I don't, <laughs> that, that, I don't. I don't actually know. So, but three, what, what's the what's the next hearing date? It's on the twenty fifth. So, so September twenty fifth. Yeah, September twenty fifth, and um, I guess we will probably uh, find out whether it's going to move forward or not on September twenty fifth, uh, based on what uh, the judge got. So, if she's happy with that, um, if she's happy with the way the pr prosecution's presenting the, their arguments, then I guess it will most likely move forward. But I don't know the technical details of how it might eventually get dismissed. All right, thanks, man. Uh, so the first couple of weeks of Occupy, we've been coordinating with Commander Jason Dusterhoff from APD uh, to help get our 
bank action protesters who wanted to close their bank accounts inside the banks. Uh, if we didn't have APD working with us, uh, those folks would have not been able to get inside the banks. The banks would have been closed and we would have been able to do our action. Um, and that went on for about two to three weeks. Uh, around that time, I took a little time off, and there was planning for an Oakland Solidarity March, an FTP March, unaffiliated with Occupy uh, directly, but some people who you know had been from Occupy, I guess. And I got a phone call from a Lieutenant Spangler, Mark Spangler, uh, whom I'd never met, and said he'd gotten my information from Jason Dusterhoff, uh, commander at APD. Uh, he was asking about the FTP Oakland Solidarity March, where it was going to be going, who was involved, uh, shit like that. And when I told him I hadn't been around, that I you know, didn't know anything, uh, he said, oh yeah, that's right, I heard you were sick. And I got a little nervous and we ended the phone conversation. Proceed to call some other folks in Occupy who had been contacted, who thought their phones had been bugged. Uh, but the important thing to note is that during that phone call, Spangler identified himself as with Austin Intelligence Services, AIS, uh, something I'd never heard of before and something uh, some uh, local news reporters I, I, I let know about this at the time said didn't exist, nor had they ever heard of. So I would still like to know more about Austin Intelligence Services that work with the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force, uh, the fusion center that's used to uh, funnel communications between APD, Department of Public Safety, Department of Homeland Security, and the county sheriffs in, uh, in the area. All right. Uh, tell me in brief about your interactions with with uh, the undercover Shannon Dowell, who uh, who, is, who went by Bush. Yeah. Uh, so, leading up to the night of December 9th, um, there were many instances when Butch had who had just come up and would talk to me, had a, you know earned earn my trust like a fucking idiot. Uh, when he saw I was upset, which was many times, you can testify to it. Uh, when am I going to get tired of debating and working with these people? When am I going to get more aggressive? When are we going to take more action? Uh, at the time, I just took that to be, hey, you know, he's pissed too, and yeah, I want to I want to carry on the fight. Never thinking, oh, smashing windows, committing crimes, Molotov cocktails, anything like that. Um, so, stupidly, I blew that off. Uh, then on the night of December 9th, three days before the port blockade, Butch and his undercover Comrade Rick approached me at the corner of 2nd and Wapuka while I was walking to my car uh, asking me if I had the contact information for uh, the group Ronnie was Ronnie Garza was with. Um, I didn't have that phone information nor the address, but they said that they had these pipes and chains that they had built for them to use in Houston. Uh, that they needed to get them to them. So it's it's explicitly clear that they built these things. They're, they're using the defense that they built them to make them safer for the uh, responding officers in Houston. Uh, but they built them, they delivered them, and they got Ronnie charged with the state gun. Right there. Anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah. It hadn't been discussed. I'd like to know about the paid informants that APD used from cops who was selling drugs, the homeless elder who was selling drugs on the steps, uh, to the young bearded Trevor who provided Art Acevedo police chief with a, a list of fingered activists. Uh, that was and on the night of arrest around Halloween? That was around Halloween and was behind the police lines identifying people to be arrested uh, to White Liar, to others that were provocateurs and really busted down our movement. So we have, we have you know, obviously photo evidence that Trevor was an informant. What do we know about Pops? Do we just suspect? Do we know at this point? Pops is a known drug dealer. He's an admitted drug dealer uh, in the drag area north of MLK up to 38th Street. Uh, he commanded the Occupy Austin homeless contingency. I forget what they call themselves. Uh, we, we refer to them as 24-7 occupiers. Uh, he, he ran that show. He was very explicit that if you needed anything, you could go to him. Not just drugs, but access to sleep there or if anybody was bothering you. 
but every time Acevedo came around or we felt uncomfortable that this guy was selling drugs, uh, nothing would happen. Uh, nothing, no, no questioning of him, no running through of drug dogs, and if there were police presence on the steps, cops wasn't around. Uh, so we, we were a suspect of cops being a police informant for a long time. And uh, what better place to have one than sleeping at the very top corner of the occupation? And we still, of course, suspect we wonder about this, you know, Dirk, Dirk and Ray or the other two? Dirk, Dirk, and, Rick. Uh, Dirk and Rick. Dirk and Rick. Dirk and Rick. Rick, a little Chicano, no taller than me. Dirk, a big, bald, white, muscular dude, much bigger than me. Um, yeah, always always going around, always being uh, at the protests, marching in the FTP marches, uh, trying to encourage people to get a little more aggressive. Yeah. All right, thanks, Dave. The interactions with Bush, and I've only recently learned his real name, uh, were basically we'd go down to Austin Java, he pulled me aside in a GA, and he'd want to do something a little more than what the group was doing. Now, if we were talking direct action, that's fine, but he was talking uh, more along the lines of inciting some sort of violence, which is just, I mean, I ended up having a beer with him over at Austin Java explaining, you know, we, we can't win that, it's not a good idea, it's against our core values. Do you have, a, do you have an example of, a, of a, an act of violence he wanted you guys to commit? Uh, you know, just kind of standard riot stuff, honestly. I mean, I wish I could be more exact on that, but the truth be told, he wasn't very exact. He just wanted to do something more. So he wasn't necessarily suggesting specific acts so much as just trying to push people to break the nonviolent principle. Right. I wanted to add to the Pops question that there was a time that Brian, Dave Cortez, and I had a meeting with Mike McDonald and his assistant, Jason Alexander. Mike McDonald being? The assistant city manager. City manager, right, okay. Mike McDonald being the assistant city manager. And Jason Alexander said in that meeting that he had seen someone selling joints on the steps and had called the police out on the person who was selling joints on the steps. And I was looking right at Mike McDonald as Jason Alexander said that, and you could tell that Mike McDonald just had this look on his face of, no, I'm very don't say something about this. But I can also tell you from having been down at City Hall just about every day that it was never the case that the police investigated Pops in any way or attempted to look into this. And I would just like to know, how is it that the assistant to the assistant city manager says that he sees someone selling a joint on the steps, calls the police on it, and yet absolutely nothing happens if that person isn't being protected? Anything else you want to add? I would like to know where the infiltration of Stratford, Alec, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, where is that? I mean, at the end of the day, we are a non-violent movement, and our non-violence has been tested over and over again by these undercover police who tried to instigate us to violence and failed. So why is it that we're being targeted? Because this isn't happening just in Austin. It's happening in Chicago with the NATO 5. And it's happening all over the country. So we've seen thousands of Occupy-related arrests. And we've seen zero prosecution of bankers. Zero prosecution of people who are really vastly undermining our political system. So I would just like to say to any police officer who is listening to this, you are part of the 99%. Even Jason Mistrick, even Shannon Dowell, who makes $100,000 a year, or just about, that still makes you part of the 99%. And you should remember that your allegiance is to protect and serve the people, not the moneyed, corrupt interests. And at the end of the day, if these individual people have a change of heart and choose to stop Stop infiltrating nonviolent protests, choose to stop engaging in these practices, then eventually these practices will end. And each and every one of those people has the ability to make that choice for himself. Thanks.